Welcome Modern Tactical Shooting. Now in talking about white light and CQB, there's too many things to talk about just in one video. There are actually a lot of techniques and SOPs you need to be doing if you're conducting white light CQB. But in this video, I wanna focus on the difference between using a traditional white light with the on and off feature, where you're just going on and off to identify the target, and using a strobe function uh, for your white light clearance. Really, there are no disadvantages to using a light with a dedicated strobe function. There are only advantages, and I wanna talk about them now here in this video. So let's do it. Believe it or not, strobing lights have been around for quite some time. This Blackhawk Gladius by Night Ops, I actually got this, I think in late 2005, and has been going strong ever since. It does have a dedicated strobe function. I've used this on uh, at least three or four combat tours between Iraq and Afghanistan. It's still on the same bulb, it's not made anymore, but strobing lights or lights with a dedicated strobe function have actually been around for a number of years. So why haven't they actually taken off? I wanna get into that a little bit later, but right now I wanna focus just on the advantages and why I think strobing is the way to go and why it can help you if you're doing white light CQB. So why do I recommend strobing lights? Well, it's true any quality weapon light will have enough lumens that when you're fighting at room distance, you do get a momentary blinding effect if you shine it right in your adversary's face. But with a strobing light, it adds an extra level of disorientation uh, to that threat if the light is strobing and it's pulsating. Now you can strobe with a normal push button. If you push it on and off fast enough, you can get somewhat of a strobing effect, but a light with a dedicated strobe function pulses at a rate that is much more disorientating to that adversary. And if you can temporarily disorientate your adversary, that just buys you reaction time against them. So that is the first advantage to strobing, is it adds a little extra disorientation to that opponent when you're shining them in the face. At room distance, that strobing, pulsating light uh, really can uh, mess with them a little bit. Is it going to totally mask you and make you invisible from the enemy? No, but let me talk about a good example of where strobing lights came into play. Back in 2006, I was going through the Direct Action Resource Center's advanced CQB course for the second time. Uh, Special Forces used to have a long relationship with, it's known as Darcy, again, Direct Action Resource Center in Little Rock, Arkansas. We used to go there for advanced CQB training, and still to this day, the best force on force CQB training in the country is at Darcy. I strongly believe that. I've been there three times with different SF teams. I actually moonlighted there a little bit. I was brought in to help teach a course since I'd been through the program three different times. But if you want to take on a true tier one enemy that's going to use the best tactics and techniques against you, if you really want to test your unit capability in CQB and not just fight guys that sit and die in place in a room, but truly go against a force that has the same capability as you to see if your SOPs are up to snuff, I highly recommend going to Darcy. But back on track with strobing. It was 2006, my second time going through Darcy. I was actually using this Blackhawk Gladius as my primary weapon light, and I was strobing as I was clearing and doing all that CQB and urban fighting against the opposing force, the Op 4. By the end of the six day course, with our action after reports, our AARs with the opposing force, many of them came to me and they told me that after just an hour or so of trying to pinpoint me and fight me and I was strobing that this pulsating light was actually making them feel nauseous after a while. And they would have to take a momentary break trying to find and pinpoint where I was at as I was strobing, just because that strobing light was slowly getting to them. And again, the comments I got from the Op 4, it made me harder to pinpoint. Now, the rest of my team at the time was not strobing. They were using the traditional on-off white lights. I think it was surefire weapon lights at the time. But I truly felt an extra advantage to strobing as, again, it was a little disorientating to the opposing forces, and it made me harder to track, which I'm going to get into right now. Now, a great example of how a strobe light can disorientate your adversaries actually is portrayed in the movie Kick-Ass from 2010, 
Later on in the movie, the scene where Hit Girl is going to go save her father, Big Daddy, played by Nicolas Cage, and I'll show a little bit right here. She's using a strobing weapon light on her pistol, and it's disorientating the enemy, and they cannot really pinpoint where she is as she's gunning them down. They're having a hard time pinpointing her to a return accurate fire. Now, the scene might be a little overblown as just how blinding strobe lights really are, but I think it's a great representation of just how a strobe light can actually perform. It might be a little overdone, but it does show that effect and it can be disorientating. And that's just a single person. Now, just imagine if you had a full team of everybody strobing, how disorientating it can be as an adversary trying to pinpoint, say, a four or five or six man team flowing into the room. And I'm going to show just that here in this video. I have some clips. I'm going to play some comparisons of just regular on off white lights compared to strobing lights with a four man team making room entry. So let me talk about I'll set up the clips and we'll get right into it right here. So let me set up the clips for you. In these first few clips, it's going to be a two man team making room entry at dusk. Now I have them deliberately not shining their lights right at the camera so they don't white out the camera lens. But if you notice, especially when we get into four man video clips, when the white lights do come across the camera, especially strobing, you're gonna see it just really blast it with that strobing light. But in these first two clips, it's going to be a two man team making room entry with regular white lights and then strobing lights. Okay, here we have two man team making room entry and they're going to turn their white lights on while they clear and then when they get done clearing, go white lights off. Now here is a two man team strobing and if you can just imagine pitch black, all you have is strobing lights and if they aim the white lights straight at the adversary. All right, playing the clips side by side and again, they're deliberately not aiming their lights right at the camera. So there you have it, that's two man team conducting regular white light clear and strobing white light clear. Now let's move on to a four man team making room entry. Again, we'll kick off with four men going regular white light on and off here in this video clip right now. Okay, and here we have four men strobing. Now let's show that four man team making a room entry again, but from a different angle and it's getting a little bit darker and we'll kick it off with four men doing regular white light on off. And now we have four men from a different angle doing strobing entry. All right, using a little editing magic, let's check out some side-by-side -side comparisons of regular white light versus strobing. Again, they're not deliberately aiming the white light at the cameras, just because I don't want to strobe out the camera lens. So hopefully by showing you those clips, strobing does make it a little bit more harder to pinpoint you if you're the assaulter going against the threat. And if you're using a white light, what does it look like when you're illuminating the target? If you check out, here is an op four member being strobed in this clip. And these strobing lights, they pulsate fast enough where you get a clear white light picture. So if you're worried about the strobing throwing you off being able to aim, these are pulsing again fast enough where you're getting uh, white light for a clear shot. So that's not going to hold you up or hesitate you when you're engaging the enemy strobing. So you may be thinking the strobing lights did not look that disorientating and you were able to track the team. Again, remember I did not have them aim the strobing lights right at the camera, just completely white it out. But just imagine those strobing lights in your eyes as they're clearing in. And it's all about buying time or getting time on your enemy. Who reacts first in a gunfight will often win. And if your enemy's hesitating or it takes them a split second longer to identify you because you are strobing, that's a win-win. So why not strobe against the enemy just to give yourself maybe the chance of better reaction time? Also, really not covered, or I didn't really demonstrate it in this video, if I had filmed from outdoors looking into that house with the lights off, 
that's one of the big differences between military CQB and law enforcement CQB. In the military, you have to worry about 360 degree threats at all times, inside and outside of structures. And if you're operating with white light and enemy, if you're keeping that white light on too long, not using good white light SOPs and white light discipline, discipline, you can be tracked and they can fire into the rooms that you're at. Strobing lights make it harder again to pinpoint where you're at if you're strobing. So again, it could be harder for the enemy to pinpoint you if he's outside of a structure looking in. Law enforcement typically doesn't have to deal with that. They're only dealing with threats in that target building. They're not fighting through American cities. So why not strobe if it can buy you some extra reaction time against the enemy and again, make you harder to pinpoint. So if strobing is so effective, why has it not caught on still with widespread use in military and law enforcement? I think initially, way back when, like when this Blackhawk Gladius came out, I think it was just too cost prohibited for most white light manufacturers. This light in 2005 was really a first of its kind, this multi-function light. Strobing is just one of the features it has. And I believe this was like a $250 flashlight at the time. Now, of course, almost every Surefire light on the market is over $200. But back in 2005, $250, I think this might've been, was a steep price to pay for the individual to you know, spend their own money on a weapon light. But of course, technology has moved on and it's gotten cheaper, but most white light manufacturers still have not jumped on a strobe function. I think just because there hasn't been a demand by users, and I think just because users just don't know the advantages of strobing. Cost prohibited being the first hurdle when it first came out, so it didn't catch on like wildfire, like I wish it did. And then now manufacturers, I think, just neglect that aspect of technology. If we look at red dots, I love Aimpoint Optics. Uh, they're my true favorite when it comes to red dots. But one hurdle with running a red dot is if you go from a very dark room into a well-lit room and you don't have your dot set up for that well-lit room, you can lose your dot. So why don't we have dots that have a self-brightening adjustment mode the technology has been out there since the 70s. Good example of this, this Elbit Falcon. One reason why I love Elbit Falcons out of Israel, if you haven't seen my Elbit Falcon video, this has a variable brightness red dot. Meaning if I'm in a dark room, the red dot will dim down. And if I go out into bright white light, the dot brightens up enough so you can see it in white light. The technology has been out forever. Why is it not present on all red dots? I think just because manufacturers can get away with not adding that extra technology in there and saving money, just because most shooters aren't aware that that technology exists. And I think that plays a little bit in part with strobing lights. The technology has got to be way cheaper now than when this Gladius came out. And this Gladius has 120 lumens, not too bright by today's standards. My favorite strobing white light right now is the Enforce WML. This is the Gen 2 model. I have a Gen 1. I'm going to do a separate video just on Enforce white lights. Ergonomically, I think they're the best white light out there. It does take some getting used to this uh, switch right here. I'm a lefty, so let me change it around. But it can be very intuitive. So I'm up, strobing, up, strobing. But I'll cover the WML in a future video, but the technology is there to put a strobing function in every white light. I think just manufacturers are lazy and because not everybody's aware of strobing technology, it just really hasn't caught on. Despite the fact that I think there are again, advantages to strobing. Now a good example of just how inexpensive LED technology and strobing white lights is, my go-to EDC pocket flashlight is a Streamlight ProTac model. The reason why I like it, it also has a strobing function. I'm not a big knife guy. I don't ever envision myself pulling out a pocket knife if I get mugged or robbed and knife fighting it out. But my go-to plan is, because I'm in a mock boxing and things like that, is to pull out my trusty ProTac and momentarily, hopefully blind and disorient them uh, with my strobing light and hammer fisting them with the you know, edge of this meat grinder uh, bezel on my flashlight. That's my EDC plan anyways. But 
this light right here, this is a $50 light and it has a strobing function. So the technology is there to put a strobe function in every white light or weapon light. Changing gears, let's go from strobing white light now to actual the mounting of a white light on your fighting rifle. Let me touch on that just a little bit. I learned early on in my special forces training, I was told very early on, when you're mounting a white light, you wanna keep it behind the muzzle so you can use your muzzle to muzzle strike your adversary and you're not gonna damage your white light. And of course, with carbine link type hand guards, your white light is not gonna be near the muzzle. But with the rail technology and the modern setups now, most people are running rails that go almost all the way up to the muzzle. And the norm actually is you see a lot of people mount their white light so their white light's almost parallel with their muzzle because they don't want any shadowing when they mount the gun of that rail or the barrel shattering one side. I've never found that to be an issue, especially running these modern LED lights. So on this shorty rifle right here, I still keep the bulb mounted behind the muzzle. Not so much for muzzle striking, but that does play a part, especially in CQB. But I also don't want that muzzle blast hitting the bulb directly. That's gonna reduce the life of the bulb over time if you're mounting your white light so it's up near the muzzle. And you may say, hey, that's no big deal. But if we look at my Blackhawk Gladius as an example, they stopped making this white light years ago. Uh, I've had it since late 2005. It must have at least 20, 30,000 rounds on it. It's been mounted to different guns. And because I don't have it mounted near the muzzle, this light is still going strong today on the original bulb. And if the bulb ever does go out, I'm never going to get a replacement for it. But again, a light from 2005 still going strong because I keep the white light lens away from the muzzle. Again, there's just so much you need to know when fighting with white light. It's too much for one video, but I do want to cover one technique in this video, and it's called riding the beam. And it's something I didn't see again until I was at that school, Darcy Direct Action Resource Center, when the technique was actually employed against me by the op four there. So what is riding the beam? Let's get into it right now. So when you're utilizing white light, you actually need to be scanning and looking deep and making sure you're looking deep and well enough into those rooms and not leaving any angles uncleared. Now, early on when we only had incandescent bulbs, we had this thing known as true light, dirty light, different levels of light because incandescent bulbs put out that yellowish white light and you had an area where it was a point of no return where you actually lose that well-lit area where you can make things out. That's called dirty light. Now with LED lights, it's a more truer, even white light, which is great for when you're clearing. Uh, the lumens of modern white lights are way up there. Again, this WML modern rifle fighting light goes up to 800 lumens, super bright, but when you're looking at objects and you're scanning into rooms, the shadows that these white lights produce is super harsh, meaning super dark. You scan into a, a room, the light coming off the doorway into that room is gonna make a super dark shadow. You need to be aware of that, and that's why when you're scanning, you really need to be trying to cover all the angles possible and look as deep into that room so there's nothing hiding in these shadows. Failing to do so will result in the enemy, if they know what they're doing, riding the beam, as it's called. Again, I saw this being employed against me back in Darcy. Years ago, the Op 4 were very aware of it, and they employed it well against you if you were the one trying to clear the building. So with that super dark shadow, an adversary can be standing in the middle of the room almost, and if you don't clear the entire room, he'll stay in that dark shadow produced by the white light. Even if you're moving that white alone, around, uh, they'll stay in that dark shadow, and that's called riding the beam. And I'm gonna try and demonstrate it in this clip here. I'll show it a few times. I'm going to be scanning into our room. There's actually gonna be an enemy combatant in the room. He's just gonna stare at the shadow on the floor and move back and forth, staying in that dark shadow. And then a common thing you see a lot in CQB is guys will be scanning and they'll be pulled security, white light on. Somebody will say, hey, get their attention. And more often than not, they'll look back and they'll drop their muzzle. It will go to one side of a doorway, 
the enemy will use that lull when he sees that light drop or move around or stay stationary. He'll come and be in that dark shadow. He can actually see you and he'll engage you. And in the video clip here, I'll play it again. I'm scanning. I look behind me because somebody's getting my attention. Hey, check this out. I think I'm pulling security. And then I have another member of the team actually shining their light on the adversary. And you can see he's standing in the middle of the room. I never saw him because he was in that dark shadow. And that's what's called riding the beam. And I'll show it again from another angle. If you know what you're doing and you know what to look for, you can ride the beam. Now, generally, does the enemy know how to do this? No, but it is out there and you need to be aware of it. So again, when you're fighting with white light, you need to be looking as much as you can with your lights on, looking at all those corners and crevices and paying attention to what you're looking at. If you're giving quick looks and stuff like that, you're not giving yourself justice. Otherwise, you could have a very experienced opponent who knows what they're doing and knows how to counter white light searchers. And one of those techniques is riding the beam. Also, next time you're out and you're doing that force on force training and white lights, I urge you to try it out against the, uh, your opposing force. Try riding their beams and see how well it works for you. You might be surprised just how effective that technique is. So there it is, my thoughts on strobing. My intent with the strobing portion of this video is to convince you to give strobing weapon lights a try. I think they definitely give you an advantage with fighting with white light. My thoughts on mounting white light to the carbine and one technique, riding the beam, which can be used against you or you can use it against an opponent if they're running a white light. So it's something you need to be aware of. But again, there's so many techniques and things you need to know about when fighting with white light. Too much for one video. So I will be doing future videos covering other topics with regards to fighting with a white light. So there it is, fighting with white light part one. Hopefully, as always, you found this video entertaining and informative. Stay tuned for future videos. As always, I'm Jeff Gerwich. Thanks for watching.